So now I'll be talking about developing scientific communication or focusing on um, specifically on the importance of finding out what people need to know. And before I start, I should point out that I'm a psychologist by training and my research uh, specifically focuses on trying to understand how people make judgments and decisions and uh, in different domains. So my research is interdisciplinary in nature. I work with public health experts to understand how people make health decisions. Um, I also work with economists to understand how people make financial decisions. And I work with engineers to understand how people make environmental decisions. And in each of those uh, research projects, um, we, after we have a better understanding of how people are making decisions and of the challenges they face when making those decisions, then we go ahead and try to develop communications with the goal of helping people to make more informed decisions. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So first, um, I will discuss what we know about the features of effective communications. Then I'll introduce the mental models approach to developing communications. And the mental models approach is a systematic social science uh, methodology for uh, developing communications that aim to um, address people's informational needs. Then um, I'll talk about three example projects to which we have applied this mental models approach. And I'll end with uh, two uh, take home messages. So um, when communicators uh, or when communications are being developed, um, the goal is usually to help recipients to improve their um, understanding. And another goal may be to uh, help recipients to implement changes in behavior so as to achieve benefits or to avoid risks. Um, and how do we know that a communication is effective? Well, we could uh, run a randomized controlled study in which we random randomly assign our participants to either receiving our communication or to be in a control group. And if our communication is effective, it should improve understanding and help people to change their behavior more so than what you see in the control group. And if you've done a lot of randomized controlled studies, you can also conduct a meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis is basically a way of trying to identify those features that are most likely to make a communication effective in terms of improving understanding and changing behavior. And so uh, meta-analyses that have been conducted have suggested that effective communications have at least the following two features. First, their content reflects scientific knowledge of diverse experts so as to ensure accuracy and balance. Content is also based on formative research with members of the intended audience so as to increase the likelihood of using wording that recipients understand and to cover information that recipients actually need to know to make more informed decisions. Now, unfortunately, many existing communications that are out there um, have not been evaluated, so we don't actually know whether they help people to improve their understanding or to change their behavior. And those that are evaluated are often shown to be ineffective. And that's probably because they lack input from members of the intended audience. And as a result, they use wording recipients don't understand, and they omit relevant information that people need to improve their understanding. So a lot of communications are developed by experts sitting alone in their office, or perhaps working on a team with other experts, thinking about what they believe the audience needs to know. And unfortunately, experts do not think, or fortunately, and for many reasons, experts don't think like lay people because they have important domain expertise. But um, they, uh, they also do not remember anymore what it's like to be a lay person on their topic of expertise. And as a result, they just don't know what it is that their audience needs to know, and they don't know how to communicate that information in wording that uh, the, their audience understands. Um, sometimes even, you know, experts realize that they are not necessarily good at communicating and they may show drafts of their communication to their colleagues, but of course their colleagues may face the same problem and may not, you know, be familiar with the wording that their audience may uh, uh, understand better. I'll give you an example. So um, here you see a communication that you may receive uh, if a dirty bomb were to explode in your area. A dirty bomb is a conventional bomb that is laced with radioactive materials. 
And if one explodes, um, radioactive particles are released into the air, and experts may advise you to what they call shelter in place. And when experts say that they want you to shelter in place, uh, they mean that they want you to stay inside so as to reduce your exposure to radioactive particles and to reduce your cancer risk. Um, now, unfortunately, um, a couple of years ago when I gave a talk at the Centers for Disease Control, um, I learned that um, some of the uh, researchers in attendance had conducted focus groups with um, um, uh, potential audiences of this communication, and they found that some people interpret the advice to shelter in place as advice to go outside and find the nearest bomb shelter. Now, if you go outside to find the nearest bomb shelter, you're doing exactly the opposite of what experts want you to do. Um, you're exposing yourself to the radioactive particles and increasing your cancer risk. And of course, people may not know where the nearest bomb shelter is, so it may take them some time to find it. And all this time, they would be outside um, and being exposed. So possibly, this communication would be more effective if it used different wording, such as telling people to stay inside. <laughs> and you would know that if you had done some formative research with members of your intended audience, because then you would know that sheltering in place was not a wording that would be familiar to them and that staying inside might be a better way of communicating the same thing. Here's another example. Um, this is a communication that possibly omits relevant information. Um, it encourages people to wash their hands with the goal to reduce their risk of infectious diseases. And it may be a good idea to encourage people to wash their hands because studies show that um, only 70% of men and 90% of women wash their hands in public restrooms. And um, so putting up an encouragement like this may increase the likelihood that people wash their hands and reduce their risk of infectious diseases. But unfortunately, studies have suggested that people do not necessarily know how to effectively wash their hands. So even if you succeed in encouraging them to wash their hands, they may not do it effectively and, as a result, not really reduce their risk as much as you would like them to. Um, so studies show that most people, when you ask them to wash their hands as best as possible, they wash their hands like this or like this, or maybe a combination of the two. And when you wash your hands like this or like this, you're systematically skipping specific parts of the hand, as shown on this slide. So people often skip their fingertips when they're washing their hands, and of course the fingertips are the parts of the hand with which you may touch infected surfaces and your face. And as a result, you might be infecting yourself even when you think that you have done everything that you need to do to protect yourself. So an effective communication about hand washing should uh, not just encourage people to wash their hand, but hands, but it should probably also tell them how to clean their fingertips um, so that um, their hands are actually um, uh, cleaner and so, so that it would help them to reduce their risk of infectious diseases. Okay, so now let's talk about the mental models approach, which is a systematic social science approach which specifically tries to design communications uh, that focus on people's informational needs. It has four steps. It starts with um, uh, creating an expert model that tries to address the question, what should people know to have a good understanding of this topic? It might start with an interdisciplinary literature review so that we have a good understanding of what scientists think that people need to know to understand this problem. And you may also want to convene uh, an expert panel um, especially in fields where there is a publication lag. Um, in some fields it can take a year or, or much longer to uh, publish uh, scientific data, so you can convene an expert panel to ask experts about um, uh, data that is not out there in the literature yet. Um, and um, if you're trying to advise people on behavior, you could also invite Deadloft to help them figure out what the best strategy is for uh, uh, solving a specific problem. Then in the next step, um, we create a lay model that answers the question, what do people already know? Um, in this step, we start by conducting interviews so as to identify relevant beliefs about the topic under consideration, as well as wording that people use to describe those beliefs. And interviews can be quite labor-intensive. 
Um, and so, and, and, and it, get very, it gets very expensive to do. Um, so my recommendation is usually to do interviews until no new beliefs emerge. So you would recruit new interviewees until you're not hearing any new things anymore. And then I would say switch to conducting surveys. Because surveys um, are easier to implement with larger samples and um, can be used to test the prevalence of the beliefs that you have identified in, identified in the interviews. If you do the surveys without doing the interviews, you may not be asking the right questions. Then in the third step, we develop a communication that tries to uh, tell people the things that they still need to know to improve their understanding. And we figure that out by um, doing a systematic comparison of the expert model and the lay model. Uh, because the expert model tells us what people should know to have good understanding. And the lay model tells us what people already know. And presumably the different differences identify those topics most in need of intervention. Um, and then we try to develop the communication by focusing specifically on common misunderstandings and describe them, uh, the, the information, in wording that we borrow from the interviews so as to increase the likelihood that people understand what the communication is about. Then, in the fourth step, we evaluate the communication in a randomized controlled study, which I discussed earlier in this talk. And uh, I want to emphasize the importance of evaluating communications. Um, because as I emphasized earlier, communications are often ineffective. It's not that easy to uh, develop a good communication. And communications can also have unintended harmful effects if people misinterpret what we're saying. Um, we use the same standards for medication. So when we develop medications, we want to test whether they are effective and whether they are, don't have any unintended side effects. Uh, and I would like to argue that it's important for com communications to be tested as well. Now let me give you uh, three examples of um, projects to which we have applied this mental models approach. The first one is on sexually transmitted infections. Our goal here was to reduce sexually transmitted infections in female adolescents. And our literature review found that most sex education that had been developed at the time was ineffective, most likely because it was just repeating the same basic facts. It was telling teenagers that um, sex is bad because it will give you sexually transmitted infections and if you get HIV you'll die. And um, to avoid those risks uh, you should just not have sex or if you do choose to have sex you should use condoms. When we conducted formative research in the form of interviews with female adolescents we found that they already knew these things. So they knew about sexually transmitted infections and they knew how to protect themselves and they wanted to protect themselves, but what they lacked was this, uh, were the skills to communicate with their partners about abstinence and condom use. So what we did was something that was very different than from what had been developed at the time. We developed a DVD that taught female adolescents negotiation skills. We taught them to talk to their partners about sexually transmitted infections and strategies for reducing their risks. And we found that our DVD, as compared to control um, materials, um, reduced sexually transmitted infections in, in its recipients even after six months. And that's probably because we taught them more than just the basic facts. We taught them something that they didn't know yet, but that they needed to know to make more effective decisions. So the take-home message here is that people sometimes need more than just the basic facts. Here's another example. It's a project about CCS, which is an abbreviation of carbon capture and storage, or carbon capture and sequestration. And it's a technology that can be added to coal-fired power plants. Um, the goal is to uh, take the emissions from the coal-fired power plants and put them deep underground. And when you do that, um, you, you prevent the CO2 emissions from going to the atmosphere and possibly contributing to climate change. So um, engineers um, recognize that CCS can be beneficial and that it, because it can help to reduce CO2 emissions, but they also recognize that public resistance of a technology like this one may hinder its wise, widespread deployment. So um, we started out by conducting interviews and surveys um, with uh, um, um, people, um, members of the general, of, of various publics, 
and we found that they didn't actually know that much about CCS, uh, but as we taught them more about it, they liked it less and less. Um, what they wanted to do instead was to discuss alternatives, such as solar and wind power, which are also low carbon technologies. So in our communication, we uh, didn't just develop information about CCS, because people wanted to also learn about other low carbon technologies. So our information covered information about 10 low carbon technologies, including their risks, benefits and costs, and allowed people to systematically compare those. And we found that that communication increased people's acceptance of CCS so that they were willing to accept some CCS in uh, portfolios of low carbon technologies. So the take home message here is that to make informed decisions, people need to understand all options, not just the one that you might prefer to educate people about. And uh, when you give them information about all of the options, you may um, actually increase their acceptance of uh, specific options. And you may also increase their trust in the communication as well as the communicator. Because they don't feel like you're hiding something from them. Then the third project um, is on smart meters. The goal here was to help people to make informed decisions about whether or not to accept smart meters in their homes. And just in case you don't know, smart meters are being installed in people's homes by electricity companies to track their electricity use in small time intervals, maybe as small as 15 minutes. And the goal here is uh, to eventually um, uh, start charging people different rates depending on the demand at the time. So um, electricity is in high demand during uh, hot summer afternoons when everybody is blasting their air conditioners. And when that happens, there's a lot of demand on the grid and um, electricity companies have to run additional power plants to meet demand. And doing so is expensive and it's also bad for the environment. Um, so, um, but electricity companies are concerned that people may not like smart meters and the dynamic pricing plans that may be associated with them. So we conducted interviews and to our surprise, we found that people want smart meters in their homes. Um, but when we asked them why, and when we asked them to elaborate on their beliefs, we found that the people's wanting of smart meters was due to misconceptions about what they thought smart meters could do for them. Because they heard the term smart meters and they associated that with other smart technologies, such as their smartphones, which are useful and fun to use, right? And so they assumed that smart meters would be able to track the electricity use of different appliances in their homes and would be able to uh, help them to figure out how to save electricity. And that is, that is actually not what smart meters um, are able to do. Um, so we have not yet developed a communication for this project, um, but we do think that perhaps the term smart meters is misleading because people are interpreting it as uh, um, uh, telling them that smart meters can do things that smart meters actually can do. Um, so it might be better to use another term, or it might be a good idea to start thinking about connecting technologies to smart meters so that they can be used to help people to track the uh, electricity use of different appliances in their homes, because that's what people want and maybe even link it with information about how to best save electricity because people want that and then, then the, the, the technology would be useful to them. Um, okay, so that brings me to my two take home messages or the two principles of developing effective communications. The first one is probably followed by most communication designers and that is um, to seek input from diverse experts to increase balance and accuracy. But the other point is also very important, and I think it's often skipped, um, and that is to conduct formative research with members of the intended audience, and that may include interviews and surveys, so as to increase the likelihood of using wording that is understood by recipients and to cover information that is most in need of intervention. Thank you very much.